So we again are continuing with our Osteopathic History Project uh, before we dive into this particular author as we do in each one of these presentations. We just go back through the current emerging themes. So there are the themes that are displaying themselves and again I just want to touch on the term emergent. I use it here for convenience but realistically the themes already exist. The term emerging refers to the investigator identifying them. So these themes already exist, but realistically, when I say emerge, what I'm saying is that I've identified them where they lay. Now these themes are between authors and within authors, but realistically at this point, what we're primarily looking at is the themes that are consistent between authors, right? So we still have inconsistent epistemology. Some inconsistent epistemology is within an author or within several of the authors. And there is inconsistent epistemology between the authors just to touch on that and to extend it, although not written explicitly here, one of the ways that we see that is making positivist claims, so claims that would best be described as a singular truth regardless of observer or framed that way, but the way that the knowledge is built by these authors is constructivist in its nature. It depends on the individuals, it depends on previous experience, and it depends on environment of observation. So they're inconsistent in that way. They're making highly certain claims in uncertain circumstances. So again, although not explicitly written here, that theme does seem consistent across the text that we've looked at, looked at so far. So high degrees of certainty in uncertain situations. Functional anatomy and diseases or disease classifications as ontology seem firm. So the way to classify what's going on within osteopathic healthcare or osteopathic practice or osteopathic medicine, how, whichever term you prefer to use, they all point to the same obligate thing. But functional anatomy and the disease classification. So functional anatomy is kind of like the real reality or the real categorization system. However, using disease classifications or allopathic disease classifications is the manner in which they've been discussed or in which problems for patients have been discussed so that there's some consistency in the discussion between authors or between teacher and student. So although there's a preference for developing a new ontology or a new classification system, it hasn't been done up to this point. Also the final theme that seems consistent, individual empiricism and prejudice against other healthcare systems or pre-existing healthcare systems does seem to remain. The prejudice seems to be to varying degrees between authors, so one author, you know, some authors rather, will have a little bit more prejudice to other healthcare practices, practices, and others will have less, so more or less depending on the author. So in this discussion, we're looking at William Garner Sutherland. Now, William Garner Sutherland was a fairly early graduate from the American School of Osteopathy, however, not as early as the other authors that we've looked at so far. And that would indicate that we may have some expectation of finding some differences in how Sutherland views reality, how he views knowledge building processes or the building of knowledge or epistemology and his views of other healthcare practices. Now that's a prediction, it's not absolutely something that will hold true, but you make predictions and see if you're correct. Um, Sutherland in my experience, now this may not be consistent between individuals or between those of you consuming this discussion, but Sutherland seems to stand as a somewhat mythologized figure within osteopathy. He was the first one given broad credit for considering application of osteopathy specifically within the cranium or within the cranial field. Now if you look at old osteopathic work, you will find that they do talk about treatment in the region of the head and face, primarily essentially eyebrow down, so they'll talk about the nasion, they'll talk about the uh, mandible, they'll talk about the TMJ, they'll talk about other things of that nature, uh, eye treatments. So he's not the first one to describe working in the head, but the way that he does it seems he does get credit for being the first one to look at it this way, or look at it in a quote unquote cranial way as the term would carry on to today. So we expect some differences, or we predict some differences, not necessarily expect some differences from the other authors, but we predict some differences, partially because he graduated after most of the ones we've looked at so far, also partially because when he wrote the text that we're going to look at, it was later. So you would 
predict that some shift in thoughts occurred, and if it hasn't, then the themes stay consistent and we'll find out. So the text that we're going to look at is the one that most people know Sutherland for. I don't know that he had a large amount of other writing that's easily identifiable or findable, so we're going to look at this one. And again, we're examining it through our constraint package of epistemology, ontology, and axiology. So we're trying to identify those themes to the best of our ability within what was written in a fairly short, more or less brochure. So we look at the quote from the cranial pole. The primary respiratory mechanism. Following an address relative to the cranial concept before the Academy of Applied Osteopathy of Chicago in 1944, the question was made, is the cranial concept religious? If the concept of science, the science of osteopathy may be considered religious, then the cranial concept is likewise. The concept, so before going on, he's making a simile there. He's saying if osteopathy is religious, then cranial osteopathy also is religious. He's not saying osteopathy is religious, but you know, it's if this, then that is essentially what he's saying. So just be careful with that. Maybe don't pull from that that he's making a claim that cranial osteopathy is religious. He's likening it to osteopathy. And as we'll see as we go through, he continues to do that. He doesn't say this is new. He just says this is a continuation, more or less. So I'm, I'm foreshadowing a little bit. The concept of the science of osteopathy came during a sad period in Dr. Still's life when unable to save members of his own family. It was during a period when he lost all faith in the orthodox medical practice, an hour when a sincere prayer went out to his maker for guidance. It may be said that Dr. Still lived cl closer than breathing to his maker. Throughout all his writings and lectures, Dr. Still frequently referred to the maker of the human body. So he is in some way making a call. He's not necessarily making a call to religion. He's talking about how Dr. Still built his understanding of what is called osteopathy. He's saying it came from a pain point, a personal tragedy point. Dr. Still was a religious man uh, in varying ways throughout his life. So Sutherland is acknowledging the place that religion held in the epistemic process for Dr. Still or the knowledge building process for Dr. Still, uh, as well as essentially the, the thing that got, gave him a bit of a push, right? So he's and it's a constructivist in nature, so it depends on Still. If Still hadn't been religious at this point, then there'd be no religious discussion here. So again, he's not necessarily saying osteopathy is religious. He's noting the connection between Dr. Still, and religion, and knowledge building. The science of osteopathy is a specialty, and members of the profession who practice this specialty, as taught by Dr. Still, may be considered as specialists. The cranial concept is not a specialty. It is a mere continuation into st the study of the science of osteopathy. It is merely a firmer grip to the tail of Dr. Still's symbolic squirrel with the whole of the tree, within the whole of the tree, wherein, he did, wherein lie undreamed possibilities relative to the intelligent care of the human body. So he's again noting the cranial concept as he presents it is osteopathy. It's a continuation. It's it's not a specialty, it's just a continuation of the concept. So that actually gives us our first clue as to Sutherland's epistemology and ontology are very likely, based on this, to be similar to what has been previously examined in this process or in this osteopathic history project. Returning to the quote, our subject concerns the primary respiratory mechanism wherein the diaphragmatic respiratory mechanism is secondary. The primary respiratory mechanism includes the brain, the intracranial membranes, the cerebrospinal fluid, and the articular mobility of, cranial, of the cranial bones, and also the spinal cord, the intraspinal membranes, again, the cerebrospinal fluid, and the articular mobility of the sacrum between the ilia. So he's laying out here the anatomy that's considered uh, within the cranial mechanism, or the cranial, the cranial concept, rather, with the primary respiratory mechanism. He's saying that respiration is secondary to this. He's making maybe a call that it's not necessarily that they're separate, but that the, the diaphragmatic respiration or normal breathing is secondary to what he's talking about, but he's laying out his anatomy. So again, functional anatomy does seem to be central to the view of reality and interpretation thereof.
So here in the next quote, uh, we're talking, or Sutherland rather, is talking about cerebral spinal fluid fluctuation. It's quite important to implant a perfect image of the intracranial and interspinal membranes firmly in the mentality, and also that of the, the large body of cerebrospinal fluid. It is through these membranes in their functional activities, reciprocal tension agencies, or check ligaments, the fluctuation of cerebral spinal fluid is brought about. So again, he's working through functional anatomy as he understands it in his time. When there's a claim of a large amount of cerebrospinal fluid, that's a somewhat misleading claim based on what we understand today. So I don't know to what degree Sutherland would have understood how much cerebrospinal fluid is commonly or it commonly in most system as an average. So when you check between humans as a group description on an individual description, individuals will vary. But generally speaking, most, most humans have approximately 150 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid in the system, so around the brain, in the ventricles, through the spinal cord on average, right? That means that other, some individuals will have more, some individuals will have less, but the average to be expected is around 150 milliliters of fluid, which is not a lot of fluid considering the surface area of the body that we're talking about. There are times when cerebrospinal fluid is known up to go up to 300 milliliters. And again, that's an average for the classification of hydrocephaly. So your head's swollen because you got too much fluid. 150 milliliters, not a lot of fluid. 150 more is doubling it. So in the spaces it does occupy, it's a big deal, but it's still not a lot of fluid. So we want to be careful with that. Again, when looking back on it with our new knowledge. So he's going through knowledge building process. Functional anatomy is the way that he's interpreting it. And he's essentially blending knowledge without telling you the specific pieces where he found it, why, how he put it together, but he's done that process, right? So this is again a bit of a constructivist process because he's not identifying the sources of this knowledge. He's probably more or less assuming that you know it. So now we have a longer quote, again, from the cranial bowl, and we'll just go through it and comment as is pertinent. So study of the articular surfaces. Like Swedenborg, who studied anatomy 200 years ago in search of the soul, Dr. Andrew Taylor still studied the handiwork of his maker, the human body. Through the study, he developed an unusual physiological anatomical knowledge tending to a superior skill in diagnosis and technique. So technique just as a term, so if you've read this if you paused the video or took the time to read it, T-E-C-H-N-I-C -E is essentially technical application. It's tech, it is kind of technique, but it's really talking more about the skill of applying technique, a technical skill, just so that you may understand that word. Through a like knowledge of the body mechanism, osteopathic physicians may improve their skill in diagnosis and technique. Quoting Dr. Still, an osteopathic physician reasons from his knowledge of anatomy, he compares the work of the abnormal body with the normal body. So, what Sutherland has done there is made a claim that is both epistemological and ontological. He is telling you how osteopaths are supposed to build their knowledge through a knowledge of anatomy, right? So anatomy and realistically functional anatomy, we can extend that in, I think, a fair way. But functional anatomy to understand the difference between the normal and the abnormal body. So when comparing the normal to the abnormal body, that's likely done in patients presenting for, for care in some way, shape, or form. And then that can, not absolutely does, because Sutherland isn't making this explicit, but it can point to individual empiricism. So you build it through your knowledge of anatomy and your individual experience over time with variations in patients and variations in the patients as they express normal and abnormal. Right? So he's telling you how you build knowledge. He's telling you how you interpret, right? So how you classify the normal and the abnormal. You classify the normal and the abnormal with functional anatomy. So that's your ont ontological step. That's your classification step. Likewise, in the cranial concept, we must possess a knowledge of the cranial structure, both within and without. We must know the position and purpose of each bone and th be thoroughly acquainted with each of its articulations. We must have a perfect image of the normal articulations that we wish to adjust. Now, I'm going to point to the challenge with that. So that's, a, I believe, another direct probe from Dr. Still that we just went through uh, that's in quotations on the page. 
the idea of the perfect image, right? So something that you can visualize, a perfect image of an articulation is a normalized one, right? So that is one that's ideal, not one that is observable in any given patient with consistency. It is apparent when studying anatomy that the same person side to side is not fully symmetrical. They're asymmetrical enough that you can note it. I would suggest if you have a plastic skeleton, a, a full plastic skeleton, if you do something as simple as look at transverse processes on the same vertebrae, that you'll see that they're different side to side. Spinous processes are different in the midline. They're not all in midline. They don't all have consistent shapes compared to one another. They have a general shape, right? So they have a shape that you can idealize. But those plastic skeletons were molded off of cadavers, so they are at least singular suggestions that humans are asymmetrical in a consistent way. That consistent asymmetry in real anatomy or obligate observable reality that the patient presents means that that idealized articulation that you have in your head is not what the patient is. That doesn't mean it has no value, it's, but you have to understand it's a schematic, it's an idealized value, or it's an idealized concept, so its value is in its ideal, not its reality. You have to pay atten more attention to the patient than you do to the idea. If you're paying attention to your idealized functional anatomy, not the functional anatomy the patient presents, you're going to have more problems with treatment. You'll always f have some way to fail and continue to treat because you can't identify that the patient doesn't meet the ideal. So I just want to put that as a word of caution. And the argument that I'm, that I'm making is the argument between essentially ideas as the most real thing and objects as the most real thing. In treatment, objects are the most real thing. The patient is the object that is outside of you that you are experiencing. Your ideas may guide you, but they are not as real in that situation as your patient. So you have to pay more attention to your patient than you do to your ideas. So you, ontological, ontologically, in the philosophical sense, osteopathy is best applied with respect to realism. Objects are the most real thing, not ideas. Okay, so that's just an argument that I will make to insert here that can go along as a companion with what we're talking about. To finish the quote, in order to have this perfect image, it will be necessary to study the articular surfaces of each separate cranial bone as well as the various shapes and angles. The cranial osseous structure is, the mechan is mechanical. The osteopathic position is mechanical of the human body and is, is necess as necessary for him to understand the body's mechanical operation as it is for an automobile mechanic to understand the mechanism of an automobile. Uh, I think what I would do is agree dominantly with the, the term mechanism, like the mechanism, how it works, but understand that although you know how it works, it is highly variable. Although cars are made to fairly tight specifications, there is variation within the same model of car. There are different features that can cause different differences with, between cars. So you understand the mechanism, you understand how it works, you can troubleshoot it. I would say the same is fairly useful with respect to osteopathy. Uh, but again, I would caution you against the firmness of this statement saying, I know how cranial bones articulate, I know what they look like, therefore I know how to treat them all. You understand how they relate to one another with that knowledge, but you have to pay attention to the patient if there's to be any value. So I think it's fair to say that this is a considerably shorter presentation than the previous ones, and part of that's just the nature of the text that we're looking at in the cranial bowl being relatively short compared to what we've already looked at. What we've already looked at is both books and more than one book per author. That said, we want to consider the emergent themes here. Did anything really new show up from the way that Sutherland was suggesting that you create knowledge and interpret reality or classify reality with respect to osteopathic care? No, he didn't really add anything new. So we could have predicted or we did predict that there may be some differences between Sutherland, but not really. He's fairly down the line with what we've already identified. That said, is it fair to make a claim that this is exactly how Sutherland viewed the world and this is the only way that he did it? No, it's not because we don't have enough information to go on. We have one small piece of work, but within that one small piece of work, we do identify that the themes are consistent again. But what it did do is really double down on functional anatomy and individual empiricism, right? So functional anatomy, just think about the cranial bones, know how they relate and understand that cerebrospinous fluid fluctuates. 
and all of those things and what that's then going to do to the ligaments and creating tension within the cerebrospinal system. So understand that and then you'll know exactly what to do, right? So he really did double down on that. Um, when I say he doubled down on individual empiricism, it's that idea that you can take the concept from your head and apply it to the patient. Uh, he is in some way saying that if you know how the ideal cranial bone works or the cra ideal cranial bones relate to one another, then you'll know what to do. And I'm going to caution you against that because the patients are not symmetrical side to side. They're not the same as one another. There's enough differences that you can identify them in some way. You can differentiate them. So nothing really new added here, more or less par for the course for what we've seen. So we continue on in the next one. What we'll look at is what osteopathy looks like in the present day in writing with respect to the concepts of epistemology, ontology, and axiology.